Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and during the battles of the Wilderness and Spotsylvania Courthouse, Hill fell ill and relinquished command of General Jubal early until his health improved. Now, with the Union Army on the move, Hill would resume command. On May 20th, Ulysses S. Grant and the Army of the Potomac abandoned the area around Spotsylvania Courthouse. He would move to the southeast, continually attempting to cut Lee off and forcing the Confederate commander to move to protect the railroads and the Confederate capital. On the 21st, Lee met with several of his generals, including Hill, who urged that he was ready to take command of the Corps again. Lee ordered it done and they began discussing the upcoming movements. The Army of Northern Virginia shifted to the southeast. On the North Anna River, the Union Army found a river crossing at Jericho Mills. Lee, too ill to ride his horse, rode in a carriage to the location and declared it a feint that the Union Army would cross further downstream. Hill was unconvinced and sent Wilcox's division to investigate. He found Governor K. Warren's V Corps crossing in force and moving south in the trees following the river. Wilcox sent word to Hill and Hill saw this as an excellent opportunity with a Union Corps isolated on the south side of the river. Hill told Wilcox to advance and attack. Later he ordered Heath to support Wilcox. The light division formed up and slammed into the Union soldiers sending many of them fleeing. It looked like a chase until the Confederate left took significant damage and began to break, creating a disjointed attack where some brigades fled, others stayed put, and others attacked. This lack of cohesion resulted in Warren shoving the division back and a rain brought the engagement to an end. Wilcox claimed Heath did not support him sufficiently, but in any sense, the Union troops on the field easily outnumbered the Confederates, and once Warren's men regained their composure after the surprise attack, they quickly mounted a successful counterattack. Hill's corps lost 650 men, and on May 24th, Lee went to Hill's headquarters in considerable pain, partly from stress and partly from other ailments like intestinal pain. Lee, in anger, asked, Why did you not do as Jackson would have done? Throw your whole force upon those people and drive them back. Hill sympathized with Lee's pain and in a reverent manner did not reply. Lee was frustrated, to say the least. He had lost the initiative to the Army of the Potomac, he was now simply countering Grant's movements instead of forcing Grant to make those counters. Lee's ideas resembled his plans a year or two previously, when his army was stronger and capable of sustaining such grand attacks. He realized that defense remained his best option, and something not in his nature. Hill and the Army of Northern Virginia again moved to counter Grant's movements. When the armies got to the Chickahominy River, Hill's corps occupied both flanks of the army, separated by the First and Second Corps. Hill located his headquarters near Gaines Mill, where he fought courageously two years previous. The two divisions of Hill's Corps on the Confederate right were situated near Cold Harbor. The Union 2nd Corps under Winfield Scott Hancock opposed them. At 4.30 a.m., 50,000 Union soldiers attacked 30,000 Confederates. Destruction reigned on the battlefield as Hill's men defended themselves against the blue assault columns. Confederate soldiers used bayonets and plates to scrape and dig small depressions during the lulls to withstand the infantry and artillery fire. One soldier in Heath's division remembered, one line would fire and fall down, another step over, fire and fall down, each line getting nearer us until they got within 60 or 75 yards of some portions of our line. But finding themselves cut to pieces so badly, they fell back in a little disorder. Our men seemed to rise all at once with a rebel yell and poured lead into them. The old field in front of us was almost covered with their dead. At 12.30, Grant called off the attacks, and each side took stock of their respective ranks. Lee had held off the assaults. Hill's men performed well, but the Union Army was again on the move. On June 13th, Lee received news that the Union lines were empty. Lee already dispatched early with a sizable contingent to the Shenandoah Valley to deal with the Union threats in that region, so he moved what he possessed southward. Grant crossed the James River and struck out for Petersburg, a town of 18,000 people, but the sight of three railroads and the place where a dozen highways all converged. The James River and the James River Canal both supplied ways for troops to move and thus illustrated its importance to Lee. Hill rushed some of his troops to Petersburg while others stayed to the northeast of Richmond to guard against a possible Union thrust in that direction. The situation remained perilous for the Army of Northern Virginia. They were outnumbered and the enemy was converging on the capital. On June 16th, multiple Union Corps threw themselves at the works around Petersburg, commanded by Confederate General P.G.T. Beauregard, but to no avail. 
Hill now moved with the rest of his troops towards Richmond and Petersburg. A few days later, the Union Army struck out for the railroads to the southwest of Petersburg. Hill prepared his men for a counterstrike. Brigadier General William Mahone took over division command from Anderson when that commander replaced Longstreet after Longstreet's wounding in the wilderness. Mahone graduated from the Virginia Military Institute and afterward became a successful railroad president. The ground through which Mahone's men were to attack had been surveyed by Mahone for the Norfolk and Petersburg Railroad. Mahone led his troops over the landscape expertly and approached the Union line without any indication of their presence. At 5 p.m., Hill gave the order to attack and Mahone's men swept over the blue troops, driving the men of Hancock's 2nd Corps. It quickly turned into a stampede, as Grant said. The Jerusalem Plank Road fight was a late afternoon affair that was short and one-sided. Mahone shattered two federal divisions, inflicting 3,000 casualties, seized four guns and eight regimental colors, all with minimum losses. The 1,700 Federals captured on June 22nd represented more prisoners than the Second Corps had lost at Antietam, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville combined. The next day, Hill sent Mahone on another strike against the Union left flank, where he captured another 600 Federals. After that, Mahone's men were given a good rest. They had been in the field for around 48 hours without sleep. By this point, both sides sat in their entrenchments opposing one another. On the morning of July 30th at 4.45 a.m., the earth below the 18th and 22nd South Carolina shot upward in an incredible explosion, throwing muskets, equipment, and men skyward, leaving a gaping hole 170 feet long, 70 feet wide, and 30 feet deep in the middle of Hill's line. 110 Union cannons let loose an immense bombardment. Hill was awake that morning and was resting on his cot at Corps headquarters when the explosion occurred. He leapt to his feet, took a quick look at the smoke swirling in the sky, and started for his horse. I'm going to Mahone's division, he shouted to his staff. Before he left, he stated, I will take his troops, all that can be spared, to the point of the explosion. He personally led troops to Mahone's aid, leading them up a ravine and then into open combat with the Federals who marched across the expanse between the entrenchments to the crater. Amid the chaos, a powder and soot-covered South Carolinian asked an officer if he could join in the fight. The officer asked, How high did they blow you? The private responded, I don't know, but as I was going up, I met the company commissary officer coming down, and he said, I will try to have breakfast ready by the time you get down. When Mahone brought more reinforcements to the crater, the Union troops began to give way and head for the rear. They left many of their comrades, both black and white, in the crater to be slaughtered by musketry and bayonets. At 3.25 p.m., Lee wired Richmond that Hill's men threw the enemy back and retook the ground. Although Hill played a significant role in plugging the large gap in the line, he gave the accolades to Mahone. He stated, Anderson's division, commanded by Brigadier General William Mahone, has so distinguished itself by its successes during the present campaign as to merit the especial mention of the Corps commander, and he tenders the division, its officers and men, his thanks for the gallantry displayed by them, whether attacking or attacked.